The LNP in Queensland is behind the reimagined plan to take excess flood water from North Queensland to provide drought relief in western and southern parts of the state. It's the new Bradfield scheme and from One Nation, Senator Malcolm Roberts. Uh, Malcolm, great to see you once again. Thank you, Mike. It's good to be back. Look, we're hearing much lately about the Bradfield scheme, uh, the modified Bradfield scheme, the hybrid Bradfield scheme, uh, and other Bradfield scheme scenarios. Can you tell us about this and what we need to do about water in Queensland and what it could do for the state and the country? Sure. There, there are two really main factors. One is southern Queensland and southern western Queensland, and that's part of the Murray-Darling Basin. We can talk about that separately. The other one is the, um, the, the Bradfield scheme, as you said, Mike, and that can bring water to many parts of Queensland, particularly the Flinders agricultural region, which I'll talk about more. But before we do that, and before discussing what the Bradfield scheme is, let's just be very clear about what's happened with the Bradfield scheme. It was developed in the 1930s by uh, Bradfield, who was the designer of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, an outstanding engineer. He walked all over Queensland, surveyed all over Queensland, and he came up with the scheme. Now, it's interesting. Pauline and One Nation have been pushing that consistently, consistently, consistently. 2017, Deb Frecklington said the Bradfield scheme is technically impossible. Bad idea. Not going to happen. We have stayed on it so hard and so relentlessly that she is now forced to adopt it. But the Labor, the LNP is, is notorious for saying things and not following through. Now, the Labor Party, I'll give you some history on that. Um, the, in around about 2004, Peter Beattie was the Premier and there was a strong, a, a deep, severe drought on. And so people raised with him the Bradfield scheme. He said, no, nah, no, nah, all rubbish, don't worry about it. And then two years later, um, the drought was still on and he had to be seen to be doing something. So he commissioned a study on the Bradfield scheme. Now, in 2008, that, propo that proposal showed that it was viable, but nothing happened under Labor. Nothing happened under, under Campbell Newman. And if anyone was going to build it, it was, it was Campbell Newman because he's a decent man. He's a civil engineer himself. He knows about this. My concern is that both parties are now saying they're behind it, Mike, but the Labor Party will never build it because the Greens won't let them. And they always pander to the Greens. The Greens set Labor Party policy. The LNP will either not build it because they're, they're, they have a history of lying on this matter as well, or they will build an emasculated version and that will hinder the development of the real Bradfield scheme. So now to answer your question, the real Bradfield scheme was developed by uh, Bradfield himself and it involved damming the waters of the Tully, Herbert and uh, Burdekin rivers in, in the hinterland behind Cairns, Tully and to some extent Townsville and sending the water west into the Thompson and then into Lake Eyre, creating uh, wetlands in Lake Eyre, which would change the weather and bring more water to Western Queensland, make it an agricultural uh, paradise. We don't see that. What we see is a hybrid scheme, modified scheme, and we see it this way. Damming the water on the Burdekin River, it's already got one dam on it, but then having two more weirs, and I'll explain the difference between a weir if you'd like me to later in the dam. Uh, so we, what the benefit of a weir is that it doesn't prevent the floodwaters from flooding the lower areas, to, for the, the agricultural land that is. So what we do then is we have minimal impact on the environment, but then you can still capture water. The second thing, the reason why this is a modified Bradfield scheme or the hybrid Bradfield scheme is that we envisage hydro power being generated, about 10% of Queensland's power, just like the Snowy Mountains. So this is a much smaller scheme than the Snowy Mountains, much smaller impact on the environment, Highly beneficial, though, for agriculture, and, and that's the damming of the of the Tully, Herbert, and Burdekin rivers. Uh, sorry, the the moving of some of the water from those rivers into the Flinders agricultural region. And that would keep Queensland water then in Queensland. It would. Um, it could be built bigger, mm -hmm. and then that takes some of that water to the Murray Darling Basin. But what we envisage right now, I've been all over the Murray Darling Basin, as you know. And we have come up with a plan that has five points in it that will enable the Murray-Darling Basin to take care of itself. The only external water it could possibly take is from the Clarence River. So we keep Queensland water in Queensland, but we help because of the Murray-Darling Basin, the southern part of Queensland is in the Murray-Darling Basin. We could help that area just by better management of the resource, Mike. The mm. Murray-Darling Basin does not need water from Queensland, from North Queensland, 
because it, it just needs to be managed properly and honestly. Before the interview, you uh, mentioned that One Nation would build weirs and not dams. Can you explain the difference and why dams are not the way to go? Da- well, dams are sometimes the way to go. It all depends on the circumstances. But what happens with these northern rivers is it's very seasonal. And, and so they flood in the, in the uh, wet season. And that cuts, uh, well, does a number of things. First of all, it, it spreads water throughout the water table. It also spreads water, uh, takes sediments and, and nutrients out into the Gulf for the prawn industry and the fishing and the fish and, and, the, and the agriculture. So we have to make sure that that continues. So a weir just puts a block across the dam, ac- across the river, and the water can flow over it. it. It reaches a certain level and then flows over. So you still get the beneficial flooding, but you still get the capture of water and you still get the elevation of water in, in, the, water t- in the water table, which means... The, the water is stored in the soil, and that's highly beneficial because that minimizes the evaporation. So where dam, are the... Sorry, sorry. Yep. No, keep going. I'll, I'll let you finish. Sorry about that. One weir is on the Tully River uh, mm. near Kumbalumba, mm. uh, and, and uh, the other one is on the Herbert River. The Tully weir would feed into the Herbert. The Herbert then would feed into the, into the um, Hell's Gate Dam. So there's, there are two weirs and one dam. And the Hell's Gate Dam is already proposed by the LNP and by us over many years, and that would need to be built. It would also generate around about 1,000 megawatts of power, and, and that would be about 10, 10% of Queensland's gener- uh, electricity needs. And the cost of the scheme would be about $8 billion for the agriculture, $5 billion for the hydro, $8 billion for the water infrastructure, $5 billion for the the, um, the the dam, uh, the hydro rather, and it would be paid back in a very short period and thereafter have a lot of profit. And remember, Mike, um, hydro generation is is very low maintenance, relatively low maintenance, and has a very long life lifespan. The snowy started being constructed 70 years ago and has got many, many years left, and that generates now the needs. So... Um, it's a very feasible project. Where will the uh, new irrigation area be, though, Malcolm? West of Townsville, Mike, um, and into the area, say, west of Charters Towers, not Charters Towers, but west of Charters Towers, almost as far as, as Mount Isa, north to um, Four Ways, south to Kainuna, uh, and then east of uh, Huendon. It's a massive area, and it's got, it's got some of the best soil in the world, and I mean that, in the world. And at the moment, it's just used for grassy plains, for beef cattle, and it's seasonal because it depends upon the drought and depends upon the rainfall. Uh, but we could, with irrigation, that soil would really flourish. It, is, it would, in fact, be better than the Murray-Darling Basin as a food bowl. It would support thousands of jobs, tens of thousands of jobs, and communities of tens of thousands in, in, the, in the area. It's a massive area. Um, I, could, I, I have to figure, get the... Um, the uh, area here, it, but it's a massive area, very, very rich soil, and with enough water, which is available, would um, certainly um, power 20,000 square kilometres, and that's larger than the Murray Valley, Murray River Valley irrigation area, um, and could contribute as much as $5 billion a year in agricultural and add value-added production. Mm. It sounds great. It's been compared to the Snowy Mountains project. Is this accurate? Yes, it is, but it's much, much smaller than the Snowy Mike. Uh, and that's important to understand, but it, it's rightly compared to it in terms of the scope, um, the, the, uh, the concept, um, and also in terms of hydro, in terms of beneficial for agriculture, beneficial for the environment, and, and also um, just generating wealth for the future for many, many years. The other thing is it's being compared because it's got tunnels linking the weirs and, and, uh, and the dam and diverting water into the Burdekin. But that, that in itself is, um, is similar to the Snowy, but the, it's much, much smaller than the Snowy, but the technology um, or the concept is similar, but the technology we have today is far, far better than it was back in, the 40, in 49 when the Snowy started. So this, this project is much more uh, reasonable, much more feasible than the Snowy was back then than the Snowy was feasible. So what's required then to, you know, it sounds great, but to make it a reality? Political willpower. What happens in this country, sadly, Mike, we've discussed this many times, is that ideology and emotion drive policy, not data. If this was decided on data, 
it would win easily and be up and run up and the construction would be starting in no time. What happens is we have the Greens ideologically opposed to dams. We have the uh, Labor Party then afraid to oppose the Greens and stand up to the Greens um, and essentially letting the Greens drive their policy. We have the LNP afraid for the sim same reason. And no one, none of these parties these days uh, go beyond the short term, the next 12 months, or even sometimes the next few weeks to catch a headline. And so we need people with vision. None of the leaders in Queensland at the moment, Deb Frecklington or Anastasia Palaszczuk, is talking about anything visionary or showing any visionary leadership. What's needed is vision, what's needed is courage, what's needed is integrity, and what's needed is decisions based on data. And those, those are the reasons why the only way this is going to get built is if we elect more One Nation people into Parliament and put pressure through the crossbench on both the tidal parties. Besides the pressure on the Feds, uh, how would you get the federal government involved? Well, the National Australia Infrastructure Fund is there, is available. Uh, someone came up with a good acronym. Let me see if I can remember it. Um, no, I, I can't at the moment. I'll, I'll see if I can find it. I had some notes here. Um, the National Infra Australia, Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund is um, $5 billion worth. It's, it's a fund available for building infrastructure in the north of Australia. Hardly any of it has been used, and that's what we need to, to tap into. Uh, we also need good business case. Queensland government is supposedly putting together a feasibility study and business case at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, a uh, study rather, and and hopefully we can get something out of that. But what we need just is is the, some commitment from the national from the federal government because they've already got the money that they could allocate. Uh, it would be a marvellous project for opening up the north. Deb Frecklington has promised the Bradfield in her election platform. Can you tell me why the National Party is pouring hot water on it? Because they know they're getting eaten alive in the bush with One Nation uh, taking their voters. Uh, we've been talking sensible policies based on data in terms of water, in terms of restoring farmers' rights to use the land that the Nationals and the Liberals stole from farmers in the Howard government and the Borbidge government back in 1996. And the National, um, national voters, uh, Nationals voters are at last waking up to this and they're abandoning the National Party. So the National Party has to grab hold of something. And they, they, they're stealing some of our policies because they're resonating with people. But the Nationals, I think, are beyond it because people now don't trust the Nationals. The Nationals, we've got Senator Matt Canavan running around the Senate making speeches and, and voting for, making speeches saying that our carbon dioxide from burning coal affects the climate and needs to be cut. And, and, and the supporting policies that show that are not coal driven and then goes back to Queensland and talks about coal. I mean, people can see this. People can see that what Matt is doing. He's, he's doing what Shorten did, saying one thing in the south and another thing in the north. People have had enough of that, Mike. Mm. They've had a gutful, and, and they want the truth. And we have been speaking consistently about the rights to use land and restoring those rights, about water security and about energy and about coal-fired power stations, consistently, consistently, consistently. And so the nationals are, are desperate now, and they've got to steal another one of our policies. What about the state election? Um, can you see a change of government at this stage? Um, you were mentioning before off camera, sorry about this, but the LNP is on the nose a bit in, in Townsville, for example. Um, yet Palaszczuk has done a, you know, I have to say, has done an appalling job of governing and really looking after the people, except for the, uh, the platitudes. You are absolutely correct. Um... It is muddied at the moment, as you know, uh, I've been on the ground in many areas of Queensland and it's muddied at the moment because some people think that Anastasia Palaszczuk has actually protected them and she's been strong. Far from it. She's been a coward and she's hidden behind the Chief Health Officer and the Chief Health Officer has admitted that the only thing that she has responsibility for is people's physical health. The Premier is responsible for the economic health, the mental health, the physical health. And while the chief health officer has these restrictions in place, the, the economic deterioration of our state is terrible. And so we've got no one managing Queensland. So Anastasia Palaszczuk has been a coward. She's been hiding behind this, refusing to make decisions. She has not stepped up. She's let our, let our state wither. Now, some people think she's shown strong leadership because the chief health, the health officer has kept the borders closed. We should be making decisions based on data. And that data shows that northern New South Wales is not, not a source of COVID anymore. And so they, those borders should be open up. The Gold Coast should be thriving. Cairns should be thriving. They're not. 
because of Anastasia Palaszczuk's gutlessness and, and, and dishonesty. Anastasia Palaszczuk has got a, a very effective campaign scaring people. And when people get scared, they tend not to think rationally. So she might just scrape home. However, what I'm hearing very strongly on the ground is that even LNP supporters are saying, we need a change. We must have an LNP minority government. Get rid of Labor. That's got to happen. We have to get rid of Labor with their Greens policies. Put in place a minority LNP government with a very strong crossbench, particularly of one nation. Because, and this is what LNP supporters are telling me, they don't have faith in Deb Frecklington or the LNP, but that would be better than the Labor Party, providing one nation is there telling them to get on with the job of fixing various issues, like the, uh, the uh, Labor policy of abortion right up until birth, um, which is basically murdering babies. Um, the, the water policies of one nation, the energy policies of one nation, the restoring of property rights that one nation has been championing through our restoration or compensation. And, and these are the things that people want to see, but they, they know that Labor will never do it. With LNP, they wouldn't do it if the LNP had a majority government, but the LNP will be pushed into doing it if we have a strong crossbench dominated by one nation. And finally, uh, I can see that the, uh, the, the money that's been spent on the NBN is working very well. You're in, uh, in Canberra. And uh, you would think the MBM would work perfectly there. We have uh, technology at its very worst almost, but we got through it. Malcolm, thank you very much. And we must do this again very shortly. Yeah, and one other point, Mike, I just mentioned that our country has a naturally highly variable climate and weather system. Mm -hmm. that, is in, that is so much more important to be building dams and weirs because when, when, the, when the rains don't come, we've got a deep water storage in the form of a dam or a multiple storage in the form of a weir. And that carries us through the dry periods. And that's how we drought proof Australia because our climate, our soil is very, very good. The only problem we've got is highly variable climate and, and that means low rainfall at times. So we have to overcome that. And that's why dams are so important both within the Murray-Darling Basin and also up in, in the Bradfield scheme. We've got to have dams to smooth out our highly variable climate. Malcolm, again, thanks for talking to us. And it's nice to see that the MBN was working probably out of three out of 10, I would give it. What, what would you give it? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't go in above, above three. <laughs> I'll see you later. Thank you. But the politicians are still taking, but the uh, bureaucrats in Canberra are still taking home salaries of 800000 They are, but they need it. And that good bottle of red, very expensive these days. <laughs> Malcolm, <laughs> thanks. You, Mike.